now. Right? Yep. All right. Awesome. Okay, everyone, this is the Open Network Security Modern Group meeting. And this today will be our first project meeting where we'll begin to discuss a project that you can all get involved with for our group. So there are no group updates so far. And just to recap a little bit, if you take a look at the top portion of the screen, we do have a mailing list, so I recommend you join that for the latest information. If you're on Facebook, check out the Facebook group. If you're a GitHub user, this is mainly how you can contribute to the groups. You can uh, give us your GitHub account name and we can actually add you to our GitHub organization, which allow you to access and write to some repositories. And then based on, you know, as we build a trust relationship with you, you'll be able to access more and more things. We also have a YouTube uh, channel with um, probably over 40 something videos, including talks from industry experts and academic researchers, as well as the online course that we're putting together. In addition, we have a Vimeo page as well, and that mostly just includes at this point, the, excuse me, the uh, talks from last year. We also have Slack and IRC. So I'm actually in IRC right now, you can see. So if anybody um, wants to get in touch with me in there, I'll check it here and there. Also, our main um, method of communication for chat is to use Slack. So if you're interested in getting on our Slack team, just send me an email at uh, admin at open-nsm.net, and we'll get you on there. Okay, let's begin with the meeting sections. So the networking news, this is a section where we talk about a few news items that happen in, um, in, in uh, computer security, defense, networking, etc. And a few months ago, there was BroCon, which was held at uh, MIT, and it is a conference for the Bro Network Security Monitoring Platform, which has developed half here at the NCSA, which is right across the little uh, valley over there. And also the other half is at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California. So we were lucky enough to have some of the Bro team here on campus, and Bro is an excellent network security monitoring platform that has, has its own scripting layer where you can actually write scripts to do things with packets. It understands events, and events are generated based on packets that come across the wire. It's a really cool program. So the videos that were released uh, are available on YouTube now. You can check them out there. I actually have a, I was, I gave it to a presentation at that conference as well, and you can find uh, mine up there. Also this week, actually today, specifically, Bro 2.4.1 was released. So you can go to the link there for more information. And this is essentially a bug fix release. There isn't really any new features or anything. It's just a number of uh, bugs that were, uh, that were found, a lot because of Justin Azoff uh, fuzzing practice with AFL, AFL fuzz. So that's been interesting. Uh, moving along, the conference quarter, this is a section where we talk about upcoming conference or conference-related news. And uh, ArchCon is actually this week. Uh, Wayland and I went last year, and we had a good time. Um, this year, I kind of actually forgot about it and just realized it a few days ago, so didn't have time to make it. But um, it's a good conference. It has an NSM-focused um, as well. So um, moving along, this one's for Wayland. He is actually look, seeking out a UIUC security analyst. And you want to talk about it for a moment? Yeah. Um, so we're looking for someone working in our triage or someone who maybe isn't looking for a full-time opportunity, but they need to um, get a little bit of the area. Um, this might be uh, something that we want to take a look at. So if you're interested, just drop me an email. Um, and this is for the campus uh, network. Cool. Very cool. So yeah, if you're a student and you're interested in that, or even a young professional, do check that out. Sounds like a good opportunity. In the next section, we have the tool trade. So we're going to scroll on down here, and this is where we talk about new tools that come out. And I think Waylon posted this one in the chat the other day, which is basically a command line tool for SSL, SSL labs from Qualys to allow you to work with their API. And if you don't know, SSL labs is a service that Qualys provides, allows you to scan all kinds of certificate-based SSL services, provides various ratings on the cryptography used, the ciphers, et cetera, the strength, any bugs that could be found in the implementation running on that service. So it's a really cool program. And they now have a command line tool 
or you can actually just use it from the command line and ask it for certain things for a basic for a website. So you can be like, oh, I want to get this, I want to get the certificate information and enumerate it for company.com. So this allows you to do some enumeration on different SSL implementations on the web. Going back. So also, this, uh, this one came up today in the chat at work, and um, this is a tool called SSH MuxD. And this is, well, in the defense, a lot of us will use jump hosts to get between different uh, secure networks or secure machines. And this tool right here basically allows an easier way to jump from an SSH server to boxes on an internal network or wherever you really want to put them. You can firewall it off if you'd like, but you can take a look here. It's written in Go. But essentially, if you just take a look at the examples here, you can SSH into the example of the, the Bastion host, you could say, or the jump host. And then when you get in, it gives you a menu base. You can just press zero, one, or two in this case, and you'll get connected to that server. It'll actually pass you into that next server. So it's like an easy way to proxy between multiple systems. And it has a few other features it can do, like the, the TCP forwarding over the socket, et cetera. So it has that stuff in it. So do read, read the documentation if you are interested in playing with that. We do not have anything for the paper period, which is where we talk about the uh, academic papers that are related to NSM and other uh, professional white papers that come about. And we do not have anything for signature selection this week. And we're going get right, to get right into the containerless NSM talk. And this is our, one of the projects that we have that's ongoing. And I'm leading this particular project. I, I built 100 plus images so far already. And I'm looking for contributors to help me out. And it's a really fun and actually, it's a, for all the projects that we'll have, it'll be the lowest entry, uh, barrier entry. So uh, if, you're pretty, if you're pretty new to this stuff, it's a great way to get your hands-on hands -on experience with it and learn how to build software from source, specifically NSM tools, learn about the different tools, and also learn about this cool new, um, in for pretty much a framework now for deploying, or platform for deploying different services called Docker. So we will jump right into that. And also, if anybody is remote, please uh, do send uh, information. If you have questions or comments, you send it in chat. I do see that someone cannot hear. Um, I do want to respond here one moment. Normally I have my helper Shane today. He is out sick. Okay, so hi Tesh, thank you for the, and Sean, thank you for the responses. Okay, so it seems to be coming through on my end. All right. All right, let's jump right into it. Okay, so in the email I sent you today, well, I guess before we even do that, we'll talk about a little bit about Docker. So we're going to go to docker.com, have this open right now. And Docker is a way to create containers of applications. So there's been a trend now, and mostly because of Docker, that's pushing for this containerization of apps. And the idea is that instead of having to do virtual machines, where you actually have to translate this instructions for different various pieces of hardware, we can do something at a little higher level called OS virtualization. Or some people call it lightweight process virtualization. And it essentially allows you to share the same kernel as the operating system, and then you run applications, so using the same libraries that the kernel would use, the same glibc, et cetera. And in these, in these packaged up applications, they're very efficient because they, you don't have to do those low level machine instruction translations between different architectures. So if you talk to the same kernel, you get the same response quickly, right? As, almost as if you're on the host system running your program. It's about the same speed, very similar. There's very little overhead. And this has been in the Linux kernel for a long time. And I want to mention that this is a Linux specific um, tool that is Docker. The Docker engine is what they call it now. It used to be just Docker. It only runs on the Linux kernel. You can get the client because it actually uses a client, ar a client server architecture where the actual Docker server runs and does the actual creation of the containers. But the reason it only works on Linux is because they're using what's available, the container system used in the Linux kernel. So like, I don't know, about seven, eight, nine years ago, the Linux kernel came out, there were some uh, uh, patches and commits from uh, Google and a number of other companies to create what's called namespaces and C groups. These namespaces and C groups are the building blocks of the containers. 
So a namespace is a way to assign some, some system resource, to, as, give it some identity, and keep it separate from other system resources. The simplest way to view this is you're running top or any, any command line program or any program at all, and you assign it to another namespace. So if top is running in namespace one, and all your other programs are running in another namespace, they will not be able to see each other because they're isolated. It provides some sort of process isolation. And you can do more than just process isolation. You can do isolation of mount points, volumes, portions of the operating system like network stacks, etc. So you can have a network stack that's in this window with its own IP address, or in this, I'm not in this window, but in this namespace that is different from the network stack in this namespace over here. And these two will never know that they exist. The IP address will not, unless you set up routing, etc. They will not know or be able to reach this, this stuff in the other namespace. So that's kind of the idea of, of namespace, just resource isolation. So what that means for us is, we think of it as a, as a glorified sandbox. We can just kind of keep things securely in their own little container, and that's the idea. So the other thing that came about was control groups. The Linux kernel has this feature called control groups. And this is actually a way to provide some sort of management and control on the processes running in these namespaces. An example of this would be, to limit the number of CPUs allocated to the processes in this namespace. And you do, it actually doesn't have to be in a namespace, really. You can just create a process, like if you're just on Linux, you don't have any of these container tools installed, you can actually, if you have, as long as you have the C groups package installed and your kernel supports it, you can assign, you can run a bunch of processes and then put them in a C group, and then whatever the C group settings are to bind constraints on those processes, they will be applied. For example, you can limit the amount of CPU that is available. You can limit the amount of memory. An example would be, if you want to package up MySQL or HTTPD, you know, some form of web, Apache or other web service, stick them all in the container, right? So it means own namespace, and then apply constraints on it. And that way you can run multiple of these application services in a single machine without using virtualization. And that tends to increase efficiency and CPU time, or save CPU time, excuse me. So with these, with these two things together, these C groups and these namespaces, we have what is called containers. Now we're getting to the, the, the Docker stuff. So the implementation, the software that is used to create these things is at least now to make it really easy is fairly new. And that's where Docker came in. It made this really easy. Before you actually had to like write a shell script and basically e echo various values to, to procfs and sys, sysfs, the pseudo file systems that interact with the kernel and the hardware to actually be able to create these things. So then came along LXC, which you may have heard of. That's the Linux Containers Project. And that is a number of developers, I think it's led by a guy uh, from, some guy from Ubuntu, that actually uh, worked, working on that project. And that one's not as easy to use as Docker, but it's, ten, it's intended to be a little bit different. Docker tends to try to, to keep you in this little, this box here, where um, you, you depend on all its tools. But a lot of people are going to Docker because this box tends to have a lot of stuff that you need inside it. As in deployment tools, as building tools, it has packaging tools, it has all this stuff. It has tools to get the stats from all the containers, to easily deploy it on, on the internet. It has a repository system, so just like on GitHub, you can actually store these containers up in the cloud and you can pull them down when you need it. So it provides this whole platform essentially to make this stuff very easy to use. And hence, because of this and its ease of use, and keep the barrier low, we are using Docker. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of what the container, what this whole container thing is. And you can, if there's you Google trend it, it's actually from like 2003 to like now, it just keeps rising, it's a linear growth. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people interested and many companies now are deploying these, are, are allowing you to deploy on their infrastructure. For example, Amazon has their own container service. Google has their own container service called uh, the dual container engine. And you can actually, if you want to run your own applications, you can pay Google X amount of money and they'll run them in a container for you. You don't have to build a VM, right? And they end up being a little bit cheaper because they can save resources as well. All right, so go ahead and close out of that part. So now we're going to go to, let's see here, my shell here. Okay, so increase the, the size of this stuff um, a little bit more. If you can't see it, let me know, and I can increase it further. Okay, so I, in the email I sent out for this meeting to get started, there was a few ways to do this. If you're already on a Linux, like a new Linux system, you don't really need Vagrant or VirtualBox or boot to Docker. 
Those tools were designed for people that do not have Linux running natively so they can still interact with Docker. And remember I said the Docker engine only runs on a Linux kernel. I mean, the, the server port, the part that creates the actual containers, does the meat of the work, can only run on the Linux kernel because it's using Linux-specific facilities. So in that case, the Docker client ha actually has been ported to other operating systems. You can get it on Windows, I think, now, because they actually had Docker had a partnership with Windows recently, and OS X, etc. So, and, it, and you can actually, on OS X, for example, it's actually in uh, Brew or Mac ports. So you can actually actually pull it down that way. And all it does, it talks by an API, an HTTP-based API. So anything that can do that, you can write your own little tools to talk to the Docker engine on some Linux server you want to. If you would be like, oh, I'm a command, I'm like, oh, I want to create a Docker container, you know, I send the request out over HTTP, and the server gets it and spins up the container for you. So just be aware of that. So the tools, I have both of them here in the email. We'll walk through them so you can kind of follow along if you'd like and you're not running Linux natively. So first off, the repository for our project is unfortunately not called contain NSM. Uh, as Wayland pointed out, that is kind of, it can be confusing. And I originally wanted this just to be a, a, a repository strictly defined to Docker files only. So but I'll I might leave it that way. I might change it in the future, but that's not the point of today. I'm just pointing that out. It's just called Docker files. So let's go back to our browser here. If you go to github.com slash open it, open dash NSM and Docker files, and I can paste this into the chat for anybody that wants to see it. Click there, click there, boom. Okay. This is the repository for our stuff. And every image that I built has a file that corresponds in this particular directory. So if you'd like to contribute, all you have to do really is be able to create these, these text files that are Docker files and tell Docker to build them. And then once they work, you can send a commit or a patch to us and we'll actually incorporate it. So do send us uh, emails with patches or if you'd like, we can get you direct access to our GitHub stuff. So you can see right now, so far I've worked on Argus, Bro, Debian, Sericata, TCPW, T-Shark, a bunch of them. So now, um, in this directory though, I try to make it easy. For those that do not have, are not able to run Docker natively, I created a Vagrant file for you. So you can just go here. And if you have Vagrant installed as well as VirtualBox, all you have to do is enter this directory, so CD after you clone the repo, into this Docker files directory and type Vagrant up, and you will have Docker installed, as well as a mount point on the virtual machine for the Docker files repo. So it's already put in the machine and you can actually start begin working. So I actually did that and I'll go and just show you the, let's go ahead and make that full screen there. So we're gonna go up to the top. So starting fresh, I went, I, I copied, I went to, I, you know, I cloned the repo to, well, I call it NSM-Docker files because I actually have a number of uh, repos that are already called Docker files. So um, I went in the directory and I typed the Vagrant up and look what it did. It actually started bringing up a virtual machine. It set port forwarding available so I can connect to it via SSH. What, then it didn't, after that, and checked for guest editions. It mounted some shared folders. And you can see that it actually mounted the repos NSM Docker files right into my slash Docker files directory on the host. Or, I'm sorry, on the, in the guest. So I can access it uh, from the, in the virtual machine. And then it ran a shell script that I provide. And that pretty much just goes, goes ahead and pulls the latest Docker version from the Docker Hub or the Docker Git repository. I'm um, excuse me, the Docker Hub uh, package repositories. In this case, this VM is running Ubuntu. It's 15.04, I think. So, uh, Vervid, I think it is. And um, pulls it down, installs. You can see if this looks, my rec you might recognize some of this, you know, app dash git. So, it's installing Docker 1.7.1, which is the latest, installing C groups for you. And voila, it's done. So at this point, all I really have to do is type vagrant SSH because they accept the port forwarding for us. In just a moment, I'm actually gonna be inside this virtual machine. Yep, now I'm in there. So take a look here. I'm in, a, in the Ubuntu Vivid, it's called Vivid, Ubuntu Vivid. I'm in that machine right now. I can sudo. And at this point, I type Docker PS, and you can see there's nothing there because I don't have any, anything going on right now. But it, Docker is running. And if you want to get more information on your Docker installation, you can type Docker info. If you are running Linux natively and you want to install Docker on an Ubuntu system, you can do app-get install Docker. I believe that will actually pull it from the Ubuntu uh, packages, but they're a little bit out of date, so I don't recommend doing that. What I recommend you do is follow my lead here and just go to docker.com. And then we're going to go to 
the let's see here open source i think it might be no um projects actually it'd be faster if they change the website a lot docker download would be a lot faster and specifically remember this is called docker engine they changed the name because now they provide many different tools so we're going to go ahead and click for our version of um, Linux, our distribution. And I'm particularly interested in Debian and Ubuntu. So let's go ahead, because Ubuntu is the most popular, we'll go ahead and click on that for everybody. And basically just come down here and run and follow the directions essentially is what it comes down to. And they provide this nice little shell script. So really if you have an up-to-date version of Ubuntu or Debian, you can, just, you can just run that script right there and um, it will go ahead and install it on your system. That's essentially what that Vagrant file does as well. Okay, so now let's go back here to the shell and we're going to minimize that and we're going to go down to the next window and maximize this one. So this is me on OS 10. I'm going to clear, well, it's a mess, uh, but Boot to Docker is a tool that you can actually download from Docker's website. This is for people on OS 10. I think there's one for Windows as well. So if you're running Windows or you're running OS 10, you can use boot to Docker, which actually is just a packaged up virtual machine along with VirtualBox, along with Docker client and some other things ready to go. And you, you install it and then it actually gives you Docker available from the command line. So on my, my host system, I can do which Docker. Yes. Login credentials upon boot. That's strange. Um, no, it, the the key they have public keys for Vagrant to do it. Can, you, can is it like can you post the output to the chat maybe? Oh, is it your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, give me one second. I'm going to finish this up and then I'll come to you if you don't mind. Or if someone wants to help them while I'm talking, I'm trying to get all this done in a decent time. We've got a little bit to go yet, but I will help you, don't worry. So for the uh, boot to Docker setup, and I'll just, just to go ahead and go through the entire demonstration, we'll just go to boot to Docker. So I'll just type that in, and it is a project from Docker. So you can download it here at boot to Docker.io. And like I said, you can get it for Windows or OS 10. I downloaded the package, installed it. And then when, after I'm done installing it, I can type which doc, I already did that. And you can see that I have an installation of Docker ready to go. And this is running natively on my Mac. And that is just because it's the Docker client. There's, not, there's nothing fancy about it. It's like written in Go. So you don't really need to, it, you basically have to talk to the Docker engine on the server part to actually create the containers. So I can't create containers natively on OS 10. But if I run the client on OS 10, I have a VM ready to go with Docker install, the Docker server portion, then they can communicate. And the cool thing about this tool, it does it automatically. So we're gonna go ahead and, initi we're gonna go ahead and start it up. So we're gonna uh, boot to Docker. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut mine down. I really just wanted to show you the output earlier, but I guess I'm gonna get to it anyway. And in a moment, this machine should be shut down. Okay, it is. If we look at the help real quick, we can type uh, boot to Docker help. Go up to the top here, you got a number of tools. So if you downloaded this right off the bat and you haven't used it before, use this command first in it. This actually creates a new boot to Docker VM, okay? If you don't have the image to create, the VM needs to create, then you can use this download option. So that might actually be the first one. I can't remember the order, it's been a while. So this will actually download an ISO image of the boot to Docker, and then in it, we'll actually start making an in a, a virtual machine out of that ISO image. Get you ready to go. And then after that, all you need to do is turn the virtual machine on and connect. And to do that, you type Docker. You can do up, start, or boot. Uh, doing, keeping the same convention as Vagrant, I'm just gonna type up. And you can see it's waiting for the VM and Docker daemon to start. So what this is actually doing is it's gonna turn on the virtual machine and it's gonna run the Docker daemon inside the virtual machine. That way my tools on the host can communicate, that is my Docker client running on OS 10 can begin to talk to that. Okay, look, it says it started. Take a look right there. At this point, it says that I have my environment variable set up correctly. So the way this works is that the Docker client will read in some environment variables to tell it to, where the hell is this virtual machine? Like, that might be a question. So the environment variables you set will be read whenever the Docker tools run 
and they will be taken into account, and whatever they point to, they will contact. So if we scroll up to the top a little bit, um, you can see in my previous configuration, give me one moment, actually that might be, looks like I don't have it actually up here. Well, we can print it anyway, because there is an option for that. Might be, yes, so the shell in it, option will actually print those environment variables. So if you do this for the first time, you're first creating your VM, it'll actually print those out for you. But I've already created this VM, so it's gonna actually, all I need to do is type that in, I'll give you the environment variables. So shell in it, and voila. All you need to do is copy and paste three, these three variables. I'll go ahead and do that now. Control C, or Command C on uh, OS X, and then Command V to paste it all in there. They're all paste now, you can see. And at this point, if I type Docker PS, it communicated with the server and it responded back as you can see the, the PS actually lists the containers that are running We don't have any running. I can type docker info and actually get the info from the server There you go. I see the docker server tells you the file system It's using the execution driver the kernel version blah 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 and the operating systems to customize the version of Linux called boot to docker Awesome. So now we're communicating with the docker server running in the virtual machine from our host our workstation Okay, so at this point, we can begin working on some things. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the layout of the repositories. And this will hopefully give you some insight into how this all works. So I'm gonna go to, let's go to this terminal window. Sorry for all the terminal windows. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, increase the font size here. Okay, so now we have it here and what we got going on here is that Vagrant file we saw earlier, a little bit of, of a readme. And the way I designed this, every single tool has a clean structure. And all it is is directory for the tool with the name of the directory. Then underneath that is the version. Let me go ahead and just demonstrate that. So we use the tree tool and we'll say bro. And you can see here that we have bro is the, sub, the top directory, then 1.5 version is the next to all the way up to 2.4. You notice that each and every single one of these subdirectories that are the version numbers, there is the Docker file. Now the Docker file tells Docker how to build this particular container. And let's take a look at one of these. So let's go to the one for bro 2.4. Okay, and here it is. And it's fairly simple. If you look at it, you can tell a lot of it's just the normal Linux commands that you would use in every day such as installing packages and changing directories and pulling stuff down. So, so the, up to the top, we'll go through this. So just to, just to go iterate a little bit or to go back track a little bit, um, to create Docker images, all you really knew, need to do is have a text file, just a standard text file that has Docker instructions. It's fairly simple. So you'll come to know the instructions over time as you play with them. And it's not too bad because there's actually not that many. I think there's less than 20, so it's not a big deal. You can actually learn them all fairly quickly. So the top, the very top instruction here, outside of the comments, is the from instruction. This tells Docker that when it reads in this text file, when it reads that first instruction in line four, from, to go ahead and pull in the open NSM Debian image. So what this actually means is Docker has to know what this open NSM Debian image is. And I've already created these things for you. They're already up on the internet. You can actually pull them down. So. I'm actually using Debian, and we're gonna use Debian for all these projects, and if this project grows so large that people are requesting um, different Linux distributions for these tools, we can provide that as well. But for now, all the tools are based on Debian, because it's very small and tight-knit, and it has a very uh, large uh, number of packages to make things installing easier. Okay, so we go down, this is the maintainer, and I, just, I created these, so I'm saying I'm maintaining it. And this is just your tag. If you're the author, you put your author name there so people know who to talk to whenever they need to make changes and stuff or edit or have trouble with it. And the next down on line eight is a label. This is something that's fairly new and I just started using, this actually allows you to, whenever, this isn't really too important, but for organization, when you have so many images, if I type that Docker PS command and there's like 30, 40, 50, 100 images, you don't want to have to go through all those and find the one you want. So with labels, you can actually filter on the key in the label. So I can filter on the organization or I can filter on the program. So I can tell Docker to filter on bro and it only print me the running bro images. So that's kind of nice. Next, down on line 12, we have well, an environment variable. 
It's just like in, in any language where you have variables. You're saying the variable name is vert user in this case. It is the second argument. And the third argument is the value that it'll be set, of the, that the variable will be set to. And in this case, it's called open innocent. So I'm assigning a, a user name called open innocent. So when anybody logs into, which we'll see later, when anybody logs into the container, um, they'll actually be running as user open innocent. That'll be your user name. Below, I use another on line 14, a program called bro. So I set a variable for bro. So I can just refer to the prog, uh, that variable in the future. That way I can keep this template across all my different to all my different builds. Going along further, we just more things. If it, you set the extension of the file, the version number for that, a prefix, this will actually be used whenever you're building it. So you're gonna pass it to configure and make. And this will actually tell the, the target where to put the installation. And we're gonna follow the, uh, the, the convention of putting everything that we want to install that we'll be using for this container inside slash ops and then the program name. Then we set the path because when we, when we launch the container, we want the user to be able to have that program in the path so they can just type the program name and it'll work right away. So, so what that means is actually all these things will, all these environment variables will actually be available whenever you run the container. They're not just for building it. They will be shell variables that you can access whenever you're inside the container. Then we're going down to line 25. And this is where we use the run instruction. The run instruction is a very simple instruction. It'll be the most important instruction that you actually use. And then it just runs a command on the file system, right? It just runs a Linux command. And in this case, we're, we start off building our container by updating the package list. We use app dash get update. The dash QQ option, if you're not familiar with that, is just to do quiet output so it doesn't print so much information to the screen. Then we, in the next line, number 26, we just install the packages we need. So for to build bro, we actually need a number of packages, dependencies. We need cmake, we need make, we need gcc, g++, or just a bunch of, just a bunch of build tools, flex, bison, et cetera. So I package everything in here. And a lot of these tools, we want to make it so we keep them as small as possible. So if there are packages that we don't need, and there could be in some of these, then we can actually remove them, rebuild them, and make them smaller. So when you're, if you contribute to this project, take care to know exactly the dependencies that you need, and then just remove them if there's things you find that are not necessary. Keep the images small. Next, what we'll do is we'll go into the compilation and installation section. So after we installed all the dependencies, we are going to use this user instruction. Now remember that variable we put up there that was called vert user? Well, here's where it gets replaced. It says, hey, vert user opus NSM is now user. What that actually means is after this instruction is executed, we run in the context of this user. So now we are open NSM whenever the next commands below are executed until we hit another user command, for example. So one below that is work directory. So instead of doing run CD and then the directory name, you can just use the work directory instruction to say, hey, for every command that follows this instruction, be in that directory. So from here on, we will actually be, after this execute, we'll be at home open NSM. Because again, work user is a variable, it gets replaced with the value of open NSM. So that means that we're gonna be, in, whenever the wget is ran to actually download the bro source code, the user will be in home open NSM, essentially. Kind of keep it tight. And then after that on line 32, so we have the source now downloaded because of line 31, we're in line 32 now, and now we're gonna go ahead and enter the source directory. So we're gonna set the, the current working directory to home open NSM bro dash version. And if you look at the environment variables above, on line 18 we have vers.2.4, and then we have prog as bro, so those are replaced, and you're now in that directory. And then what do you do next? Well, now you need to start the configure process. You need to generate the make file, you need to build the package. So in this case, on line 33, we run the configure, and we specify the dash dash prefix to say, hey, where we, this is the point where we're going to install bro. This is where bro should end up being on the file system. And that prefix is set, if you look above again, it's a variable to opt bro. Going down one further, we are now becoming context root. And why do we need context root here? Well. To install packages on the file system, where the file system requires root permissions to write, such as in slash opt, etc, user, bin, etc., you will need root. You can build the packages or the build the software locally as a normal user, but you can't install it into privileged or directories that require write permissions from privileged users. So to actually install the software to the proper, proper location on the system, we actually need to become root. So now we're in context root, and guess what? 
We run make install, and then we use some uh, command set permissions. So a little caveat here. One thing that kind of sucks is that the back ends for Bro are different. And a popular one is called AUFS. It's a copy on write file system. And it does not support capabilities, the Linux kernel file system capabilities that you can use to delegate specific permissions to a particular binary. So to make this our Docker image work across all these backends that people might have, whether it's BTRFS, whether it's device map, or whether it's AUFS, we have to find a way that all these things are supported with one commonality that is traditional in Unix, a set user ID, right? It's, 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 it works just about everywhere. So in these containers, that's fine. So this will allow us to run our bro or, or any of these tools with set user ID, ID bit set so that they will run as the permissions of the owner of that file. So that means we don't have to have login as root and then run. So you can just run Docker, Docker, then the run, and then the, the image you want to run directly from the command line without having to change root. Because remember, the user that you become on the system is open and assign every one of these. That's, the, that's just the template we're following to keep it standardized, keep it uniform. And then at the very end, we have cleanup, which just removes the uh, source directory. And then we have the environment variable at the very bottom, which uh, again says, hey, after this, this last thing ran, so user, whenever you run the container, you automatically become OpenNSM there, and you automatically be placed in the work directory of the OpenNSM user. So home OpenNSM when you launch the container. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, do ask me right now. Um, sorry, I made that theory. I made that like a command. <laughs> My bad. Well, just ask me whenever if you'd like. So we're going to back up. So now that you saw the directory structure, very simple, what we're going to then go into is the Debian. So the Debian directory. And this is where all those images are built from, right? Because you remember that from, that from instruction that says, hey, first pull down this image, then apply all the stuff on top of it. So the base Debian image looks like this. We'll go ahead and look it up. Jesse, Jesse's the latest one for Debian. It's a little bit simpler. So again, we're, we're actually pulling it from Debian's official Docker repository called Debian. And they tag it with Jesse. So this is the particular version of Debian. Then we go down to instruction number eight. We set an environment variable, again, the user open NSM. And if we go down further to instruction 11, we start installing the tools that we want to have across all our, all our images. And what are some tools that you would want to have for everybody? Well, not everybody uses the same text editor, editor right? There's a religious war between VI, base editors, and Emacs, for example. So we want to install all of them for to make everybody happy. So you don't just have to log in and pick your own, or install your own manually. It's a pain in the butt. This whole project, which I think I glossed over when I went in the beginning, but the goal of this project is to make everybody, to make it easier for people to try out different NSM tools directly from their system, and also to perform research against different versions of the tools. Maybe you can find performance regressions between two different versions, for example. So our, our vulnerabilities and see where the, where, where the issue is and where it isn't. As well as just, just again, the, the, the main one though is making it very easy for people to try out these tools for this group and for everybody in the world. This is a, a public and a free open source project. So the other things we install are common tools that you might want to have whenever you're doing these comparisons and stuff, like debugging tools. You want to have LSOF, you want to have HTOP, DSTAT, SysStat, IOTOP, STrace, LTrace, etc. so we can actually trace and profile some of these tools. And then we go down further, Earlier we saw that in the, in the Docker image, it actually used an open NSM user. Well, to actually have, to be able to become that user, you actually have to have the user created in the first place. So this is where this stems from. We just run commands as add user, we disable the password, and it's gonna be open NSM. So that creates the user first. Then below, we actually have the default password set, so if the user wants to log in and wants to become root, they can do that. And you can see by default, we actually have uh, the root password is open NSM, keep it really simple. And the vert or the open NSM password is just open is the username open NSM with the password open NSM because again vert user is replaced with in the environment variable with open NSM. And then we add the final thing in this is we add the open NSM user to the pseudo group so they can use pseudo. All right, and that concludes the Docker files. So now we're getting some. Now we're going to start uh, using the tools. Now let's go ahead and start. I'm going to begin by using them on my both systems here. So. Um, my boot to Docker system, type Docker PS, and you can say Docker PS shows you the running processes. So these would be the Docker containers running. There's nothing there. If you type Docker images, go ahead and make this full screen. 
Da, da, da. Docker images shows that there is one image available, open NSM dash Debian. That was the one we showed you earlier. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna type Docker pool, and we're gonna say, I want open NSM slash, um, let's do TCB dump. Nope, so actually, okay, I should, I should actually backtrack and say that all the ones I'm pulling now, when you type Docker pool, is actually pulling it from a repository. All these are available on hub.docker.com. And if we go back to the browser, this is the website right here. So any of these that you click on, we'll go to TCB dump for example, you can refer to the name. So our group name slash the, or the repository name. And if we go to the tags, we tag, we do tag versions. So now you have open it, you have TCB dump version here through here, the little out of order. That's how many versions I was able to build so far. So you can, you can, then you can ask for any of these versions. So if going back, if I want an older one, such as 3.9.1, I can actually pull that down. If you want the latest one, you don't, you don't say, uh, you don't actually say which version. You just leave it open NSM slash TCB dump and it'll pull the latest one down by default. It does that because how it works with that is there's a tag actually called latest. It just points to the most current. Okay, so a little bit more about this. The way this repository is set up is if you make a commit, it is linked to Docker Hub using automated builds. So if I change something, it'll actually rebuild it and push it up to, to the uh, Docker Hub website. So if we add a new user, for example, or install a new package, Docker Hub will detect it through some API call from GitHub. They have, a, they have a way to synchronize between the two. It'll actually start building the new image and it automatically be up and ready to go. So at this point, you can see that it pulled down the image at each layer. Each one of these is a, is a hash for a particular layer of their file system because you just copy and write. So now I can say Docker PS, and again, nothing's running. I can do Docker images, and remember, we just pulled down an image. So we have OpenSM TCB dump 3.9.1. So I can do Docker run IT if I want to actually get an interactive terminal and give it the image and say 3.9.1 and I want to get bash. I actually now in that container. And TCB dump is installed right here. Look at that. We're actually now listening on the, uh, in the container with four packets right there, ready to go. Look at that. So it's kind of nice. So you see easy, how easy that was. All you have to do is someone else builds a container, all you have to do is pull it down and run it. Now you don't actually have to go with the container though. We can just, since we have it in the path, we can just do TCB dump dash uh, N and I, and we'll do ETH0, imagine ETH0 is there. And look, I'm already running, sniffing in that VM with that version of TCB dump, right? I can do for a bunch of them. So in, in this, so what we're gonna do now is, um, do I have a good for loop for this? I've created a, well you didn't see that. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. So let's go back. Um, now we'll go back to the the actual other the uh, not the Bootsy Doctor VM, but the um, the Vagrant VM, and we'll do the same thing. So just to show you that you can use these tools, well, all these tools in different ways. So or in the same way, I'm sorry, they all provide the same service. So again, Docker images shows the images that you have. Docker PS shows the running containers. So. If a container is running, the, the out, output would be in PS. So let's go ahead and pull out some more. Let's pull down uh, open-nsm slash bro, and that will give us the latest version of bro. And in the meantime, well, that's we're gonna back out, and what we're gonna do is, oops, so we didn't mean to do that. Oh, uh, latest. Oh, no, well, apparently I'm missing the latest tag on bro, so let's try a different one. Let's try open NSM slash, uh, just get the latest TCP and see if I have the latest tag set to that one. Yep, got it there. So now it's pulling that. And it's downloading that version of TCP dump. So it's going back here. Let's go to another window. Oops, I actually closed out of that one. So let's go ahead and download all a bunch of images. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do Docker pull, um, for I in, we'll do, um, I don't know, 2.4, we'll do uh, 2.3, 2.2, hopefully you don't have any errors. Um, Docker pool, let's just make sure that works, echo I done, yep. So what we'll do is we'll do Docker pool open in the SAM slash bro and the tag here, I, and then that will start pulling down those three particular version of the images. So now we're between the, we're pulling out an image in Bootsy Docker and we're also doing a Vagrant and just to show you how you do in each one, it's practically the same thing once you're in the VM or you're working with the Docker tool.
Any questions now? I want to take a break. Yes, what's up? To pull it down. So I did, you can do Docker pool and then the, the organization name uh, and then slash the repo name. So in this case, just, to, just so you can see it with the website, it is um, going back a page, one more page. The organization name is OpenNSM, okay? And you can see it right here. And then the repo is bro. So Docker pull OpenNSM slash bro. And what I, what I did was I pulled down in a, in a loop for different versions. So what I typed out was, I guess I can just show you that here. Um, go back up. I did this. This is just a little for loop to say um, for each version, I is replaced with those, those version numbers to pull down each one. You don't have to do that if you want. You can do it by hand. It's just a quick way to do it real quick. So I'll we'll let those download. And then we'll be able to run between different versions. I can show you that. Um, so and you had, you need to come out with Awesome. Yeah. Great. I'm going to start the uh, Docker. Are you, um, are you using the Vagrant or are you using the Bootsy Docker? Okay, so in uh, Vagrant, it should already be running. All you have to type Docker space info and see if it has anything. Yeah, it sounds like Okay, then do um, status space Docker, and that will check out the, the init script to see if it's running. It's possible that the conf that it actually, well, no, because you do have the tool, it did tell you this. Okay, what, um, are, you, are you using the Vagrant file that we used? Yeah. That's weird. Hmm. Let me, uh, Hold on one second. Let that download here. Let you guys get caught up. I'm gonna go home. So we're going to start. Ah, great. So, and this is what you're getting down here, right? So, I was thinking. So, the reason this is orange, we need to be root to root. So, yeah. Try to get the big one. Pseudo. So whenever you do the machine, they just have to be any errors or anything. Just no. the ones that's in the market for it, it's just not there. Okay, you're right. Um, okay, so I think what happened, well, it looks like the script kind of ran, but I don't know if it's like, give the terminal number that shows like whenever you ran the figure out. Is that somewhere? Maybe I'll figure out why we can't play. Okay, okay. We may have to build and start over. I actually don't know enough. Okay. 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 Okay.
Well, it doesn't actually, it's actually a doctor. It's more system computer. This I'm not using as a program. It's a spin that's related to the system. Um, but it's Okay, so um, also, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it should use the Does anybody remote has any questions? Do uh, send them in chat or ask them over the unmute your microphone and ask them. The reason that didn't work is so what all it did was it didn't attach that. If you had a question, let me know if there's any issue. Okay, so um, I'm back over here now. And now we have, a, we see, can see that we have a bunch of these images on this, uh, I downloaded So we type Docker um, images, you can see all the three versions of Bro are tagged and available. So if I wanted to do Docker run again, dash I, well, let's go ahead and use one warrant in the background so you can see how the whole thing works with the daemon and the Docker PS. So if I do Docker open SM Bro, give it the tag number that you want to run. For, so basically when you pass this to the Docker run command, what it does is it grabs the image, it tells the image was to run, and then it creates a container from that image. And it will say, hey, just run top. It's not that exciting, but now it gave us the hash. Now if we type Docker PS, that, I don't know why that executed. Um, one second. That should have stayed. Nope, I think I need to add, oh, for top, you probably need to allocate a terminal. That's probably why. Let's see if that did it. Yes, okay, so I didn't allocate a terminal. Top, top died because it didn't have a terminal. You can see that we actually have that bro, open NSM bro image running with the command top. And the command that you pass as an argument to the image, it ends up being the first process inside that image. So it acts as the init process, but it really doesn't because it won't reap dead children. It won't properly handle failures and waiting. Um, so that's really not a concern for us though because it doesn't actually run as a service. But if we do this again, we actually want to run bro this time. We should be able just to do bro on dash i eth zero. And it's now running bro in the background in this particular image. and we can actually go back inside the image. So if an image is already run into enter it, you can use the docker exec command. 
and we just give it H for help and this gives you some information and wants the container and then the command to execute. So we're gonna actually say, because we want to shell, we want to allocate a TTY, we also want to make it interactive. So the standard out and standard in is, our standard in is actually allocated to this so that you can talk to, you can type in there. And we're gonna grab the container ID and then we'll say, well, give us bash, right? And you can already see that bro wrote out packetfilter.log. There really isn't any traffic, so bro's not really doing anything, but it already wrote out one log file, just let it go, you know what I mean? So this way you can run multiple versions of bro in a loop, for example, you download all those, you want to do four, I, in each one of those, you could have that many like versions of bro running. And we'll just go ahead and try to do that. Four, I, in. You have that many versions. Oh, I hear some echo. So someone's got their mic on, I believe. Okay, looks like they may have muted it just in time. For I in, uh, we'll do we'll do the same thing. Um, let's grab the last one here, and we'll just do um, this, and we'll say run bro at the tag, and then we'll say bro dash i. And actually, just before we even do that, let's just run them all in a loop just to print the version number for bro. I think it's dash v. Is that right, Vlad? Is it dash v or dash version? I can't remember. Don't remember. Okay. <laughs> Yep, dash dash version, okay. And here you can actually see that I'm looping through each image. I'm creating a container of each image where each image, all it does is just print the bro version. So now if we want to, we can run bro and all the, um, we can have it run just recording traffic, dash i, eth zero, and it's the dash d will actually send it to the background. Now we have three containers running, all doing bro things. So bro is running in each one of these. So if you want to see like the log differences between each one of these, you can go and check them out, right? And there are other things you can do. Like you can mount each one of these containers to a file system so it's actually written on the host with the dash dash volumes command, et cetera. So hopefully some of you are interested in this, in this particular project. Uh, if you are, um, it's easy to contribute. Like just get this, all you need is the, the access to the, um, the GitHub repository, you can begin working. So now, just to show you how you would do that, we're gonna go ahead and work on and build the new image right now. So Pro 2.4.1 came out today, and we should be able to create a brand new image from that. So let's see this. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna go ahead and now go directly to my Vagrant VM. And remember, we, I could do it in Boot to Docker, or I could do it, uh, thanks for coming, um, or I could do it in Vagrant. We can go to, um, how are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, so I'll wrap this up here in the next 15 minutes. We can go to Vagrant um, directory because again, that's mount, I'm sorry. Well, it could, it could be either Vagrant or Docker files because in my, in my actual um, Vagrant config, it says, hey, sync the directory from my repo. So it's just gonna be in there. So I'm just gonna go to slash Docker files so it's easy to remember. And we're gonna go to the bro directory and we're gonna go ahead and create a new directory called 2.4.1. So this is the process you would use if you had to create a new version of a tool. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the version from 2.4, Docker file on the 2.4.1, right? Let's go in the directory, 2.4.1, and now we have this Docker file. In this case, since Bro probably hasn't changed much, since this is a bug fix release, it should be fairly simple. All I have to updo is update a few variables. Um, we're gonna go ahead, those at the top, I really didn't have to change, but I like to keep everything consistent, so I just changed it to 2.4.1 so it represents what's in the file. And then see this version, all we really have to do is add one, and I think that's all we have to do to build a new image of Bro. Now if a project, if a piece of software in the new version required new packages, right, new dependencies or libraries changed, then you have to go and edit that and make, make those changes. But Bro is, 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 I think, at the most part, the same, just a bug fix release again. And all we have to do is build this new image. So all we have to do is type docker build dash T and we'll give it a name and we're going to say build it as, thanks for coming, uh, 2.4.1. So again, we give it the organization name, OpenNSM slash the repository name, which we're, we're doing a tool per repository, so it'd be the same name as the tool, and then the version that we're going to build. And so that when it builds, it actually just, that's the name that you see when you type docker image. It just gives it an, a, a unique name that we can use and identify. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to pass it the Docker file, and to do that, you can just use the dot. If the Docker file is in the local directory that you're in, the dot refers to the current directory. So you just pass the dot, and then Docker will actually just look in for a Docker file right in that particular directory. And then here we go. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and do full screen before I do this. 
And at this point, we are building. It, remember, see, it shows you st step by step. Instruction zero, which was the from, so it makes sure it's got the latest open NSM Debian image, right? It pulls that down from the Docker Hub, because remember, we're actually using that as our base image. So oh, this is it right here. And we have three different versions, because some of the software is older. So we have Jesse, Squeeze, and Wheezy available. And if you don't specify the version as the tag, then it's going to go to the latest version because I have the latest tag, and that is Debian um, Squeeze, I believe. I always forget the Debian uh, version names, but. So it's pulling down the OpenNSM Debian image, and then it's going to execute the next instruction in the file. If you guys remember what the next instruction was, it was just my maintainer, this, the guy that built it, right, the author of it. Then it's going to skip over, and it's going to go down to the next few. And I'll set all the environment variables, and it'll eventually start executing those run instructions. And this process will take a little bit. So for labels, I probably um, Docker PS. So those labels that we saw earlier, we can actually take a look at the output here. You can do dash filter, and you can do, uh, I think it's label equals organization equals, it's kind of ugly. Open NSM, and I think that will actually just print the, um, nope, I apparently messed that up. Label organization equals open NSM. Do we not need this part? I don't think that's right. I think you actually do need that. Nope, apparently I'm wrong. Okay, so what we do here is that actually printed, it's, not, it's less ugly than I thought. Okay, so this printed all the, the images I have here that have the organization uh, label applied for open NSM. If I want to print the other label, remember we actually have these in the repository. If we go back um, here, you can see that for example, bro 2.4 docker file, we have a label program equals bro. So if you have all these hundreds of images installed, we can actually just filter on that one. And to do that, let's just go back and type uh, filter prog or prog prog equals, and then, oops, let's go ahead and get all that, prog equals bro, and that'll print all the stuff, all the images that are bro related, right? So if we had TCP, we don't have to print all those, but we don't have any, oh, actually, the, apparently that didn't work as way I thought. Let's go to the help. I forget. I haven't, I just started using labels in Docker, so let's go ahead and just walk through this, Docker labels. This will be a good time, get you a chance to do something while that's actually um, building the newest image. Okay, so we already applied the labels. Docker PS dash dash filter label equals, so I did have the original thing right. I don't know why that, what I did wrong exactly, but so it's late, it is ugly. Uh, label equals key equals value is the, is the way they do that. So um, Docker, so essentially I just need to do label equals and if everything is right, then that should work. Doesn't print anything because we don't have any TCP up here, but let's try bro. If I print bro, nope, so um, let's switch over. Apparently I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, I've done this before, it does work. I just gotta make sure I got the right filter. Um, oh, it's program, I'm an idiot. Okay, so it's program. But that didn't work either. Strange. Program equals Thanks for coming. At this point, I'm actually unclear as to what the problem is. I wish I had my history saved because I've done this a few times. Uh, program equals label equals program. And if I do label equals organization, open NSM, it does return, or at least it, well, let's try that. Yeah, it doesn't return, so strange. Let me try it, and maybe there's a version difference between the boot to Docker one and the one I have in the VM. I'll try that next. But going back to the task at hand, okay, so what, what did it do? So it actually pulled down the, the OBN NSM Debian image, and then you know, it's, it runs through every instruction as a step. Labels here, label here, so all the environment variables. So you can see users open NSM, containers, or program is bro, et cetera, et cetera. And we finally get down to the important stuff is where we actually start installing the packages. So essentially all it's doing is just running those instructions that you put in the file here. And it is now in building all the dependencies or installing all the dependencies for Bro. 
And after that, it's going to pull down bro 2.4.1. It's going to compile bro 2.4.1. And then it's going to install it. And after that exits, we'll have a brand new image ready to go um, for bro 2.4.1. Now, we have to, for anybody else to be able to use it, we actually have to put it online, right? We'll have to put it on Docker Hub. So if you're interested in, or you, you develop trust with us and you start working on these things and you, you look like you have the template, the design down, the basic structure down, then I'll give you access to our Docker Hub account. And from there, you can actually deploy these yourself. So anybody can just put, push a new one up. So we talk about Docker pull to pull it down, to push it up and to put it on the repository. It's just Docker push and then, the, and then open NSM slash the name and the colon the tag and that's it. So in this case, once this is done, it will, it will be docker push open NSM slash bro colon 2.4.1 because we're building, we want to tag it as that version so it's easy to, you can just use a name to refer to that particular version. Here we're getting, they can see it actually progressed. We actually downloading the source code of bro. There's the tarball right there. It's going to unpack it and then we're going to build it. And bro takes a long time to, to build so um, we'll, I'll just leave this running. Does anybody have any questions? Is anybody interested in working on this project at all? Does that sound interesting to anybody? Cool. Anybody remote uh, interested in working on this project? Oh, Jason said it's dash dash filter. Well, I think they do the shorthand form too, but I'll try that. Uh, thanks for the input. Let's give that a shot. I filter and change it to something we know. Oops. That's not what we know. Nope, same thing. Strange. Okay, so actually now while that's doing stuff, we'll just do a few more Docker commands. Uh, so we have all these running sys things, and we're going to go ahead and just stop them all. Actually, let's don't stop them all. Let's do something else. Let's, let's actually get the status, some status from the system while the tools are running. So Bro is running on each in three of these. Three versions of Bro is running in containers. So we want to actually get the logs available on each directory in each container. So what we can do is we can do a for i in, and docker ps-q will only print the hashes of the unique IDs for each container. So you can actually use this to get, the, get um, to exec. So for i in, and we'll do um, here, everything in here. We'll, uh, that'll be enumerated as a list. We can do um, do docker exec, and we'll say I, because that will be replaced with the hash. We'll go in that side of that container and execute some command. And the command we want to execute is ls. Star dot, well, actually, I don't know about the shell. We'll be able to handle it. Let's see what happens. Okay. Because so, that let's do that. Because it, that will evaluate, the shell will actually evaluate that as what the current, um, the current shell will actually uh, glob that. So anyways, in this case, look at what we did. We, for each of those, we actually printed what was available in the containers. And we can actually make it a little bit nicer and just do um, I or echo I and then do dash N maybe a little bit and do this. And now we got the hash. Well, actually, it doesn't look too pretty. Just do it like, and also I don't want to play around with this too much. But anyway, so now we've got the hash and the files that are in that and the next hash. So you can see for this particular container, it's the con.log is available and packet filter.log. In this container, we have con.log as well and packet filter. And they'll be the same because all of them are sniffing the same traffic. We all started at the same time. So let's just kind of a quick way you can actually go through and do stuff in these systems are these systems so we can also do uptime if you want to check some stats the at will load in each one of these containers so you can see they're all the same stuff like that and to build on this to stop a container you can do docker ps or docker stop and you can give it the container id we'll want to, we want to stop this one running top so i'll go ahead and type stop if you want to stop them all, again, just use some of the features on your shell to get things done quickly. And we can do 4i in, again, docker um, ps-q, and that'll print all the container IDs, the unique ones. And then we can do docker stop, and then we can do i, and that'll stop them all. Oops. Uh, syntax error, 4i in, ps-q, do, forgot the do. 
Okay, now it's gonna loop through there and stop each one. Now if we wanna get rid of those containers, because they still take up space, though not very much, because copy on write, we do docker rm, and now they are completely gone. If you do dash a, which shows you the, the last running containers, you can see some are there, but not all of them. There we go. And um, that's the ones, some of those lists were the ones we did earlier, whoops. If you want to remove an image, you can hear Docker images, you can do Docker RMI, and then you can say, I want to remove open NSM slash TCB dump 3.9.1, and then actually remove that from, because it can take, okay, so some containers already use it, you'll actually encounter this. Um, so we need to force it or go ahead and remove the other container that's using it. We'll go ahead and force it and see if that'll allow us to work. Yep, so now we do we do the container and you notice that when we delete it, it gives you a hash for everything because it actually deletes every layer of the file system. Remember, it's copy on write. So everything, every hash here is con considered a portion of the file system and tends to be uh, correspond to the actual number of instructions inside the Docker file. So bro is building and we're almost, we're getting there at 31%. And at this point, uh, any more questions? Hopefully you guys found this valuable. And when we're done, we'll be able to push that image up and I'll commit it to the repo as long as this ends up building it correctly. As long as there's these, um, you know, the exit code or it doesn't look like there's any errors in the VM or in the, in the container, we'll push it up and be available on Docker Hub. So anybody, if you want to, like, for example, if you want to do just some more trickery while we're waiting, um, repos, we'll go to Docker files again. Oops, uh, repos, NSM, because that's what I call on my system. It is, though, Docker files. We can actually go through these directories and just iterate that way. So if you watch, well, if you want to try this, watch this. Uh, we want all the um, TCB dumb ones, right? So there's a lot there. Let's go inside TCB dumb. Let's get rid of that slash. Uh, so what we can do is... I forget what the option is that gets rid of that slash. Is it, um, it's it by itself, nah. So it's F, because I have an alias, I think, set up for, yes, I do. So, oh yeah, so if we can do LS and then, uh, yes. Okay, so get rid of the slash. So I have an alias, you can do the back, you can escape it, and then the, the tell the shell not to, to use the LS F. So if we want to do all these for I in this, and really, that's not the good way to do it, though, because we, all the directories are already numbered. We should just enumerate the directory. So this, right? That's the better way to do this in Bash. So all we have to do is replace this with Docker pull and then open NSM slash TCB dump. And then again, I. Now, I will say that all the TCB dump ones, and all, almost another repo is not every single one works. I haven't been able to figure them all out yet, especially the older versions are hard to build, but all the newer stuff tends to work. Like some of the threes will work, but not like 3.5, 3.6, it requires old packages that don't really exist anymore. And that's why I had to build those other Debian base images of, of like Wheezy and uh, Jesse. But in this case, we'll actually pull down 30 something versions of TCB dump. So, well, well, I messed up that. Let's quick that. Whoops, come on. How many? How many? All right, there we go. Uh, Docker, do Docker pull open in the SAM TCB dump dash I. Um, what was the error? Not found. Oh, yeah, because those aren't actually available. So, let's do a normal, let's just do a modern one. So, we want to do um, three dot, or let's do all fours. Everything matching four. That'll work. So, it's going to match all the TCB dumps from here down. It's gonna pull all the, the, the major version four releases, and then it's gonna pull them all down, you'll have those. You can try each one out, so. Anyways, that concludes the talk. Um, I'll let this build over time, and hopefully it'll be done, and I'll put it online if everything is successful. I'll post it to the mailing list, and I'll put it on Twitter. Hopefully this is useful to you, and I hope, and I, I really look forward to contrib contributions. We'd like to have this done for almost any NSM tool available and for almost every major release, and, and if we can, minor releases. That'd be really cool to have an archive for just about anybody wanting to try out these different tools. So, like I said, it's an easy project to get involved with. All right, uh, thank you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up here, and I'll post this video online, as long as the recording was successful, and I do hope it will be. And um, that's all, thank you.
Yes. Sean, so, do you have like a standard set when you create Yes. And essentially, uh, what we're doing is we're following the, um, one second. Okay, so um, yes, uh, I think you missed some of the, the stuff, but when we were going through the template, um, basically we're just copying the template. This is the other Docker files I have. And I tried to make it as clean and clear as I could for each line that it, it just shows you that we're using, like, this, like the, some of the conventions that you're talking about would be um, the user that the, that the uh, ends up being in the container is open NSM user. We, we create a user for that. It's already done in the base image. So the last instruction in the uh, each Docker file is that user. And um, just to go back real quick, um, yeah, it's just, oops. So I got a bunch of stupid stuff in there, my shit. Okay, so the very top here, um, I'm sorry, at the, uh, here, user, yeah, so um, we, build, we, build the, we build all the tools as the local user. We install them as root. This is an example of the convention. So uh, here you become root because you have to install the tools of the root, right? To write to those privileged directories. But when you're done, here's one of the conventions that we do, is we want to make sure that whenever you run the container by default, you are the open NSM user. That should be your user ID every time you actually get into the container. You also want to do the, make sure the work directory is the home directory of the open NSM user. The other thing that's important is, since we, since the, there's different uh, Docker backends, like AUFS for the file system, device map, or ButterFS, et cetera, EFS doesn't support capabilities. It's a more secure way of allowing the, the processes to bind to an interface. But um, EFS is popular and doesn't support it, so we can't have, I don't think it's a good idea to have it so it's not compatible for everybody else that does not, that has AF, AUFS that doesn't use something else. Because AUFS file system does not allow you to do capabilities. That means that you can, uh, a binary can be ran with a small set of permissions that can be used, for example, just to open the interface and listen on it. So instead we use the old traditional Unix me mechanism which is the set, the set user ID bit on the binary, so that anybody across all the file systems can run the tools as the open NSM user, not need to become the root. And that makes things easy. That you can do like I do with the for loops, for I uh, in number of containers, run those containers and have them listen on the interface, for example. You couldn't do that without some hackish stuff with bash equal C or dash C, then become this user at A and A, and then execute this command. So instead, we just have it those those files are set user IDs, so anybody can, any user on the system can run as root. So. What about like the dependencies? Like, are we just going to try to install anything just to make it work? Or? So what we want to do is, no, we want to get the minimum dependencies required. So um, and if you see something that's, you, you know that maybe, that maybe we don't need make and see make, for example. We don't need both of these, then we can remove one, and then we'll rebuild the whole thing. And it's automated, it's connected to Docker Hub, so if a commit is made, Docker Hub will see it, because it's linked to GitHub, see that the commit, it'll get the commit, and start building this thing over automatically, build the package on Docker Hub. So you don't actually have to do anything. As long as you commit, Docker will go ahead and build it. Uh, you don't have to do it on your machine, but of course you test on your machine first, right? You Docker build it on your machine, and then you commit it once it works, and then once, you, once it's pushed to the repository, there is a link between the GitHub account and our Docker Hub account, there's a feature called automated builds. Once something has changed, Docker will go ahead and run through the whole thing again and build it on the line. And that's what allows you, that build, the automated build allows you to do the Docker pull, and then anybody, can, anybody in this room can pull these down. So just to show you uh, real quick, and then uh, I apologize for uh, those that want to get some food here, but this is a good question. Um, we'll do, uh, run a bunch of these. Let's do um, pro 2.4.1 our Docker, and then we'll do um, TCB dump, and then we'll do some version, I don't know, 4.7.4, uh, and then we'll do um, T-Shark, uh, four, or what, no, uh, one, dot, wow, there's so many versions of T-Shark. Um, we'll do this, okay. So now we have them all up at once, and um, you can see here that 
pretty much all the differences are between these files. Let me go down to each one. Uh, what number is that line 11? Okay, nope, go down further. Okay, is that the user is the same. We all become open in a SAM. You notice that the program changes. I try to make it so that the, your basic templates, all you have to do is really to some extent just change some of the variables to the version numbers. So this will install bro 2.4 because down at the bottom, uh, bro's website has it nicely so that you know you can just download the probe is replaced with the bro because it's a variable. The verbs is replaced with that 2.4 and the extension is replaced with tar.gz. So it works across all those. But not everything is easy. For example, um, TCP dump has to have two different versions. I actually, well, I compile it with uh, the version of libpcap that corresponds with the TCP dump release. They actually said, they, they actually, when they create new ones, they, they release them both at the same time because they, they maintain both the libpcap library and the TCP dump library. So I create a T version variable for TCP dump and a libpcap version variable. And then in this case, TC button actually has to, I have to go ahead and install, compile and install libpcap first. And then after that, I go compile and install TCP dump. That's just a strange case. You don't always have to do that. But now if we go down to um, T Shark, again, uh, Pro is set to Wireshark in this case because, not T Shark, because the T Shark packages are binaries actually included in the Wireshark source code. So you actually have to tell Wireshark just to build without. Um, without Wireshark and only build, so you say disable Wireshark and then it just builds the T-Shark and then plus the other tools. And it gets kind of tricky, tri tricky sometimes, but that's essentially all it is. Um, every once in a while I might have to solve the tool, but basically just follow the guideline of the variables and their dependencies. And that should get you every, everything you pretty much need. And we do a little cleanup to remove the, the source package at the end for each one, but that's about it. Um, keeps it. Keeps it sane. If you work on older versions, then you just do from like Debbie and Jesse, and it'll actually use the older version of Debbie and Jesse to actually pull it in. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, we're getting there. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off and we'll post the rest of the stuff online. All right. Thank you guys very much. How do I stop? There we go.